This is a short video on the most common kinds of headaches. I'll be talking about primary headaches, which originate in the head, as well as some of the secondary headaches that you might see presented in the clinic. Secondary headaches are usually attributed to another pathologic process in the body, and we'll talk about some of the common ones of those. So I'll be talking about the presentation, the diagnosis of these headaches, how to treat them, and how to prophylax or how to present, uh, prevent some of them. Let's start with some of the primary headaches. Let's start with the tension headache. Tension headache can be described as a band-like pain around the head. I've also heard it described as a vice-like pain. Um, it's a moderate pain. It's pressing, tightening around the head. It's usually bilateral, and it can be anywhere from 30 minutes to seven days long. The diagnosis for a tension headache is clinical. This is the headache that everybody gets um, when you're hungover, when you um, are trying to focus and you're not able to focus, when you just had a bad day and you have a headache afterwards, when you have tension in your neck and then you feel a headache, that's a tension headache. It's usually muscular in origin, but it's the headache that everybody gets and everybody treats with NSAIDs and acetaminophen, so Tylenol or maybe a Motrin, and it usually goes away. There's not really good prophylaxis for this. You might try stretching, you might try doing exercise, you might try sleeping. Um, some people can sleep it off, so that's tension headache. Kind of similar in presentation to that is the analgesic rebound headache. The key defining difference in presentation is that this patient will be withdrawing from any analgesic. This can include NSAIDs, acetaminophen, ergo drugs, uh, opiates, triptans, and you'll diagnose the, this one by the clinical symptoms and the history that they give you. So if they've been taking NSAIDs every day for the past like four weeks, they might have an analgesic headache when they try to stop taking that medication. So the treatment for this is just time. You have to stop the analgesic and they'll get better with time. They have to kind of suffer through it. Um, the prophylaxis for this is to instruct patients to not take analgesics for more than 10 days of the month. Next are migraine headaches and cluster headaches. These are grouped together um, in, my, in my mind because they kind of have similar pathophysiology. They're both, called by, they're both caused by uh, vascular problems and leading the, the, the blood supply leading to the head. Let's start with migraines. Migraines sometimes present with an aura. Now it's kind of hard to describe what an aura is, but in general it's a, it's a transient sensory change. Um, this could be for many senses. This could be for the visual system, so you might transiently see a hallucination or a weird lighting effect. It could be a positional um, change. You might feel like you're floating. You might feel like you're falling. Um, an auditory change, you might have um, hallucinations, uh, like auditory hallucinations, or you might hear high-pitched noises. It could be weird smells, olfactory changes, or delusions even. People with migraines sometimes have photophobia or phonophobia. They can't stand the lights and they can't stand any loud noises. There's often a trigger with migraines as well. That could be a certain type of food, or it could be a menstrual cycle coming up, or it could be uh, something, something happening that's irritating them, causing them a migraine, um, often has a, has a trigger. The pain itself is described as pulsatile. It could be disabling. It's usually unilateral, and it can last from four to 72 hours. Now, these people usually can sleep it off. So if somebody has a migraine and they can fall asleep, they can usually wake up and feel a little better. So it gets better with sleep. It's usually worse with physical activity and worse with um, sounds and lights. So photophobia and phonophobia. The patient can also have nausea and vomiting with a migraine as well. Diagnosis for migraines are typically just clinical, so all the things I just described. The treatment for migraines kind of depends on what that patient is feeling, how bad the migraine actually is. Some people can treat it just taking NSAIDs. Um, for others, NSAIDs don't touch it, and they need some stronger drugs. You might use triptans or ergotamines. The prophylaxis for migraines, there are a few options. You can use beta blockers. The best one is propanolol. You can use anticonvulsants like valproate and topiramate. And you can use uh, amitriptyline as well, although amitriptyline is a tricyclic an uh, uh, antidepressant. It does have a bunch of side effects, so that's less commonly used, usually the propanolol. Next is the cluster headaches. These present as episodic in nature. The name cluster headaches comes from the fact that these headaches cluster in time. There's usually months between clusters of headaches. And during those clusters, um, during that period of time, they can happen up to like five hours and they, sorry, they, they can last up to five hours, and they can happen several times daily during a cluster. Um, and what's weird is that in between clusters, the months between clusters, the patient might have no pain at all, might have no symptoms at all.
So during the cluster, when they have the pain, it's usually pretty severe pain, and there's all these weird eye changes around it. So they might get rhinorrhea, they might get lacrimation, ptosis, conjunctival injection, they can get eyelid edema. The pain is usually unilateral, and it can kind of just be on the side of the face, or it could also be supraorbital, periorbital, or temporal in location. Now the diagnosis for cluster headaches is also clinical. In this case, you do want to do neuroimaging to rule out other etiologies. So usually just a CT scan or an MRI to make sure it's nothing more serious. The treatment for cluster headaches is pretty unique. They tend to go away uh, pretty quickly with O2. So if they're in the hospital, you might hook them up to 100% O2 um, just to give them some pain relief. Um, the pain in cluster headaches is usually pretty severe, much more severe than a tension headache or an analgesic rebound headache. So these patients are definitely going to want something um, to, make, to, to make themselves feel better. Oftentimes, the, the pain is just driving them crazy. If the oxygen itself doesn't help the cluster headache, you can try triptans. The prophylaxis for cluster headaches are the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. You can use verapamil or diltiazem. So those are the primary headaches. Next, let's talk about secondary headaches. They usually have like another etiology or another process in the body that's causing pain that's going to the head or to the face. Let's start with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. This usually presents as a woman, usually in her reproductive age, and she's sometimes overweight, and she might be taking oral contraceptive pills, which have been linked as a risk factor for idiopathic intracranial hypertension. This disease is also called pseudotumor cerebri. So the diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension is usually made with a CT or an MRI. Um, you can kind of see increased intracranial pressure using those imaging techniques. If you were to do an LP, you will also see increased opening pressure. Um, interestingly though, the, on the LP, the cerebral spinal fluid itself is normal. So it's really just the pressure, um, it comes out quickly. Now the treatment for idiopathic intracranial hypertension is acetazolamide, and you can also use some other things. You can use steroids. You can do serial LPs to kind of reduce that pressure continuously, and you can also put in a shunt if they have it recurring or if it's pretty bad. The prophylaxis is not much. It's really just weight loss, so try to prevent the risk of recurrent attacks. I next group all these three together because they, they all kind of cause face pain. They might not technically be considered secondary headaches, but they kind of fit in with this talk, so we can go through them quickly. First one is trigeminal neuralgia. This is a severe face pain. It's been described as knife-like or stabbing or lancinating pain. It sometimes radiates down the face to the ear or to the jaw, and it's often precipitated by chewing or touching the face. I've heard a story of a patient who had trigeminal neuralgia who kept on having this pain even when just the wind would blow against her face. So a pretty severe pace, uh, pain triggered by not much movement, not much um, touching of the face at all. To diagnose trigeminal neuralgia, you want to do an MRI to rule out spinal cord compression. The treatment for trigeminal neuralgia is carbamazepine. It's an anticonvulsant. The pathophysiology of this disease is kind of just a seizure of the trigeminal nerve, so it makes sense that the treatment is an anticonvulsant um, carbamazepine. Next is shingles or postherpetic neuralgia. This presents as a dermatomal rash and pain on the face. It's going to be unilateral because it's dermatomal. It's sometimes in a line, like it could be across the jaw, it could kind of just be a patch, uh, a patchy rash on the forehead or maybe on the cheek or on the chin, but it's always in a dermatome. The diagnosis for this is clinical. The treatment is a cyclovir, um, anti-herpes. So herpes or shingles is a herpes virus, so the treatment's going to be anti-herpes. The prophylaxis is going to be a vaccine, so zoster vaccination. Next, giant cell arteritis. This presents as fever, weight loss, face pain, and they'll often have a swollen, tender temporal artery. So that's an artery that goes kind of across the side of the face, and they're going to have pain across that side of the face. The diagnosis here is a high ESR on a blood test, and you can do a biopsy as well of the, of the artery itself. The treatment is steroids. You want to give this as soon as possible because it does risk blindness if you don't. Next are these three, and these have the do not miss red flag symptoms. So if somebody presents with a headache, you'll first be thinking to look for these uh, red flag symptoms. and. If they don't have red flag symptoms, you're most likely going to have one of these primary headaches and also keep these other secondary headaches in the back of your mind. So one of the red flag symptoms is a thunderclap pain or a thunderclap headache associated with subarachnoid hemorrhage. 
It's called Thunderclap because the pain goes from zero to maximum intensity almost immediately. Um, it's also been described as the worst headache of the patient's life, and it's associated with recent traumas. So all of those things um, in a patient that presents with headache would be pretty scary and pretty concerning for subarachnoid hemorrhage. The patient might also have elevated blood pressure. Um, now, elevated blood pressure is also a risk factor for subarachnoid hemorrhage. The diagnosis for subarachnoid hemorrhage is a CT without contrast. It's pretty important that you do it without contrast. Um, both blood and contrast would show up as white on the CT scan. So you want to make sure you don't use contrast in the CT scan. One, because it's faster. Two, because you want to see if there's actually blood in the brain parenchyma or in the ventricles of the brain. You can also do an LP for subarachnoid hemorrhage and you'd see xanthrochromia. That's when the CSF that comes out during the LP is a little yellow tinted. That's a byproduct of red blood cells. The treatment for subarachnoid hemorrhage is to immediately consult neurosurgery. They can come by and either coil or clip the bleed. You do want to reduce the blood pressure. The higher the blood pressure in this case, the more the patient's going to bleed into their brain. You want to stop hydrocephalus with either a shunt or serial LPs or a craniotomy. Now there's not much you can do to prevent a subarachnoid hemorrhage once it happens, um, but you can prevent any kind of seizures they have because of the bleed using anticonvulsants, and you can prevent vasospasms, which might further cause infarctions in the brain with calcium channel blockers. Another do not miss secondary headache is a tumor. This typically presents as progressive headache that's worsening over weeks to months. Usually this is in older patients, about 50 years old, they might also have cognitive impairment, maybe weight loss, night sweats, other systemic symptoms characteristic of cancer, and sometimes the pain is described as awakening them from sleep. So pain awakening from sleep is always concerning. New progressive pain in an older person is always concerning. The diagnosis here is neuroimaging, so usually CT or MRI, and the treatment is the typical treatment for cancer, so chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Lastly is meningitis or abscess, and essentially infectious causes of headache. The do not miss signs here are fever, our neck stiffness, um, which is a sign of meningeal irritation, focal neurologic deficits, or a mental status change. You can diagnose this with an LP or a CT scan. The LP will probably show bacteria and white blood cells. The treatment here is antibiotics, so if the cause is infection, treat it by giving antibiotics against the infection. In the case of meningococcal meningitis, the antibiotic of choice is ceftriaxone. The prophylaxis is um, kind of varied. It, it depends on what the, what the origin of the meningitis or abscess is. In the case of meningococcus, uh, you can vaccinate for that one. This has been a video on headaches, both primary and secondary headaches. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.